Good afternoon, Marlena. It's so nice to see you today. Happy Saturday. And maybe actually good morning for you. I don't know what time we're at anymore. Yes, it is the morning. Um, yeah, it's so great to see you. It's so funny. We were, um, you know, getting ready to click record and talking about the sun coming through the window and how that's always an asset. But California has like a little bit extra of that sunshine today. And I'm envious. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty warm out. Are you, uh, what's the weather like where you are? Um, I think we had like a cold spell, um, a couple of days ago. So it went down to 20 after being like a few days in the fifties and sixties. And so that was just particularly miserable because of like, we tasted a little bit of comfort. Um, I think we're getting back to that tomorrow, but it's been, it's been cold. It's been rainy. It's been icy. So, um, if you wouldn't mind sending some of your sunshine, I will gladly receive it. Absolutely. Will do. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, I'm so happy to be here with you anyways, um, from our different parts of the world. For anyone who doesn't know you, this is Marlena Sloss, photographer, um, wonderful, talented, so cool, your story and your background. And I can't wait to hear more of it from your perspective, um, your vantage point today. So thank you again for being here. Of course. Excited to talk with you. Yes. So um, I'm a very chronological person. I love understanding the timeline of things. Um, so I'm going to ask that we start at kind of the start of Marlena's story. You know, what were you like as a kid? Where were you growing up? When did you start to notice that, um, you know, your photography was going to be something you wanted to pursue and make your own? Yeah. So I grew up in Juneau, Alaska, which is the capital of Alaska, and it's in the southeast part of the state. It's a temperate rainforest and um, pretty remote place. You can't drive into it. You can only fly or take a boat. Um, so that was, yeah, that meant that it's a pretty isolated community, but also pretty tight knit. And I was always really inspired by just nature and the natural world growing up in Juneau and getting getting to spend a lot of time in nature. And I also, our family got the community newspaper, the Juno Empire every day. And when I was growing up and I just loved looking at the photographs in the paper every morning, um, the photos especially, but also just the paper and getting a chance to kind of see and connect with the community through the, the paper. So I think growing up, the combination of being in a really beautiful place where I was kind of felt in awe of, of the beauty and a desire to capture it and kind of through photography um, got got more inspired by it. And then also the, the paper and seeing the photographs in the daily paper, those two things kind of led me to pursue or to want to pursue an interest in, in photography. Um, yeah, that's kind of where it started for me. So cool. I don't get to meet. Actually, I have a professor right now who's from Alaska, but I would say oh, in most of my day to day life, I don't know people um, yeah. from Alaska. And it's so special. I think anytime we meet someone who um, was raised in a different setting and a different like environment to kind of understand maybe any things that you took for granted about that. Like I grew up in New York City, right? And now I'm in Arkansas. And so the idea of taking the public bus anywhere is pretty foreign to anyone here who could have a car if they wanted to. Like, is there anything about your growing up in Alaska that would be kind of novel? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's that? You an outsider. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, I think I think one big thing is that we only had one high school when I was in high school. And so in order to play other sports teams from different high schools, we couldn't drive to other communities. We'd have to take the ferry or <clears throat> within Southeast Alaska or fly up to Anchorage or Fairbanks. And so we, we are high school teams and everyone really who grew up there got used to traveling for sports and activities and band and whatever it was, but we would take the ferry for half a day over to catch a can and take the very back and it was just like such an awesome fun way to experience that those high school activities <laughs> that is so cool and such a special like immersion into this um area of the world that I don't think a lot of people have the privilege of experiencing mm -hmm. um and so from the vantage point of a kid going to a sporting event I think that's just wild and um just so special that you have that as part of your story so you started in Alaska you were receiving the daily newspaper from your town um 
Did you, um, where did you go from there? Did you ever end up interning at that paper or delivering those papers or um, was your first step outside of Juno? I would love to hear more. Yeah, I did. So I went to Whitman College um, for undergrad and studied psychology. And at that point, Whitman didn't have a journalism program or a photojournalism program. So, um, but, but when I was at Whitman, I just got a lot more interested in people and people stories, basically, and under, understanding people on the individual level through psychology. And then I think it was toward the toward the end. And during that time, I was taking some photography classes, but it wasn't my main focus. It was more the psychology degree. So then it kind of coalesced toward the end of Whitman, my, of my time at Whitman that photography, that photojournalism specifically was a way to tell, to experience that interest in people through psychology and then also merge that with photography. So I, at the end of Whitman, decided that I really did want to pursue photojournalism and newspaper storytelling. And so I went to Ohio University for graduate school. But um, I think another thing I think about with with that, oh, you asked if I did intern at the Juno Empire. Yeah, so during college, during my time at Whitman, I did get a summer grant to do an internship at a at a paper that didn't have a paid internship program. And so I went to went back to Juno for the summer at night. That was my first newspaper internship at my hometown paper. And it was amazing and really special to get to document the community and see my photos in the paper. Um, It'll, you know, not, if not every day, most days. So that was really special. Oh, that's such a cool way to be part of the landscape that you're in and um, contribute to this thing that had mm -hmm. inspired you. Um, what a what a cool part of your um, your story and your path. So, um, where is Whitman College? Is that in? I don't actually know where that is. It's in Washington State, in, oh, okay. in Eastern Washington. Yeah. Very cool. So far enough from you know. Um, to yeah sort of experience and you said that it was later in your time there that you realized photojournalism was something you wanted to pursue did I understand that yeah yeah I think I, I when I left high school I wasn't quite sure that I wanted to do that I wanted to pursue photography as a full-time thing I was really interested in biology and psychology and like other things and that was um that ended up being more my focus but then kind of toward the end of time in college thinking oh I, I do still I'm still really interested in photojournalism so I think I'm gonna go for it that's so cool was there any do you remember like a light bulb moment at Whitman where you're like oh my gosh photojournalism it's what I've wanted all this time like <laughs> I'm thinking of like a rom-com where the person like runs yeah, right <laughs> photojournalism it's you <laughs> Well, yeah, I think a little, there was a little bit of that. I had, and, and during my whole time, I still knew it was there. Like anytime I'd see a paper or a magazine or a National Geographic, I'd be like really drawn to it and, and would also have my camera with me a lot of the time and taking photos of my friends and taking photos of the different activities that I participated in college. And I did do a couple semesters on the student newspaper at Whitman, but it still wasn't quite all clicking but one moment I did have was when so my senior thesis was on the effects of poverty on infant development and basically baby cognitive development mm -hmm. and so I was doing all this psychology research and kind of academic research and writing about the topic and toward the end of that it felt there was something that didn't quite, quite feel right about it to me. And, and it was basically that this academic research and this information that felt so important was just gonna kind of sit on a bookshelf in a library. And it didn't feel to me like it was going to reach the people that it needed to reach, even though I totally believed in the work and what we were learning about. And so that same, it was around the same time that senior spring that I was finishing my thesis, a National Geographic article came out that was also about infant cognitive development and the different effects from poverty. And so it was a very similar story to what we were doing our thesis on. And it was like, oh my goodness, this speaks so much more to me because it's going to reach all these people and it's actually going to get out there in the world. 
rather than what felt like our my thesis was just gonna like sit on the shelf in the library and you know maybe somebody would read it but like not really so that actually was a pretty big light bulb moment for me that I was I cared a lot more about people understanding the information than, yeah. oh, than me doing it yeah Oh, I'm so glad that this story came up. I'm writing, I'm in my last semester of grad school right now. And so my thesis is very much weighing on my mind. Um, mm. And I, I can understand what it was like for you maybe to be reckoning with this thing of like, I'm putting so much effort into this. And I totally. believe so strongly that this information is important, but I'm going to present it to maybe three people and then right. like blip, like nothing comes yeah. for, like, I think that that's so wise that you're like, you know, had these wheels turning of like, you know, the packaging of this message does matter mm -hmm. as much as the message because the packaging is what's going to enable someone to get to the message um and i love that the not the what was it, the national geographic yeah, that yeah. Happened at the same time like that's pretty yeah. it's pretty special um so you had this light bulb moment um in undergrad and you decided to go forward but i actually um it really stands out to me too that you studied psychology and that you were coming to understand that this human experience mattered to you. I think a lot about this idea of connectedness as one of our strengths and like mm -hmm. to be able to see links between different things um, that maybe are not super apparent is uh, something that I think is really valuable. And I feel like that's something that's maybe part of your story. Do you, um, you know, when you reflect on your psychology degree now, how do you think that that makes you show up differently to a photography kind of assignment than to one else? Hmm, totally. Yeah, I think just on a pretty basic level, it helped me understand people and and kind of be able to empathize with them more and to see their experience as a totally unique thing and influenced by their upbringing and their genetics and their environment and like kind of to be able to see all of those things more clearly in the person and and that also I think helps me step into the role of the observer and just this place of curiosity and it helps me let go of my own kind of emotions or feelings or whatever it may be about or even judgments about what I'm stepping into I think that really helps me like let go of all of that and just try to be present um it's not always easy to clear my head and and do that but it it really does help in that process um and i think also yeah i think it just helps me oh it's also i think it's also helped driven me to to understand what issues are i care about and what issues are important because like I was sharing with my senior thesis, learning about the effects of poverty on infant development, like that issue is, uh, you know, is really important. And so I think there were times then when I was in grad school in Ohio in Athens County, it's it's the eighth poorest county in the country, I think. And so uh, having it, just having a better understanding of poverty really helped me kind of figure out what stories and what things I wanted to highlight when I was there and yeah so that's a wow about that. yeah that sounds like it ended up being a really important part of that transition yeah. to grad school and the purpose that you had when you showed up there and um so now we're in the part of the story where you are in studying visual communication at Ohio um what um is it like being in those classes like are your peers mostly people who studied photography in undergrad and are seeing it through the next level like what what is that space like yeah so my cohort at ohio university in the photojournalism track um was i think there was eight of us to to begin with and most people had not studied photography before and we, we kind of all had varying backgrounds. A couple of us had come straight to undergrad and that was me. And then some, sorry, straight from undergrad. And some had had, there was one person who had had a career in radio and was shifting into visuals. And then one person who had a more scientific background and was kind of merging their science with photography and more conservation storytelling. So we all kind of came from different places, but most of us hadn't had a lot of formal training in photography. That's so cool then to see, I guess, how each person shows up differently and yeah. you have to learn from each other. Totally. Um, 
in a really expansive way because of all of these different sources of knowledge merging around this idea of photographing things that are happening in the world. Totally. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. So throughout this time, um, you did a lot of different like internships and stuff. And I know that those will become important parts of your story ongoingly. Maybe we can speak a little bit about what that was like for you. Yeah. So in I think my first year of graduate school, it became pretty apparent to me that I, that newspapers and newspaper internships were going to be a place where I could learn a lot, get a lot of experience and just try a lot of different types of photography at a newspaper. You're doing community events, you're doing intimate stories, you're doing longer term projects, there's an opportunity to do creative kind of non-literal <laughs> projects, as well as sports and portraits and lighting. And so it's a, it is a really great environment as a photographer to learn a lot when you jump into a newspaper internship. So I did one year of graduate school and then realized I wanted to kind of take advantage of my student status and do internships and then go back to grad school and do more internships. So I kind of dragged out the whole process. In no, order why to, though? That's yeah, <laughs> it was in, I definitely didn't come up with that. There were some mentors at the program who recommended that I do that. And so I ended up doing the doing a summer internship in South Carolina right after the first year, then doing a fall internship in Indiana, and then a six month internship at a different paper in Indiana. Um, then going back to grad school and then doing a summer internship at the Washington Post to end that all. So it was, I think, four internships and two years of grad school um, in the span of like three and a half years. Oh my god! Yeah, I get I get lost in it, but anyway, <laughs> people are like, "What you went back to there? What?" Anyway, yeah, that's amazing. Um, so all these different newspapers all over the country. Um, mm -hmm. is I'm just kind of curious about like I remember. Um, so I used to work at like a media data company. And I remember speakers from the New York Times coming in when like the New York Times app first launched, you know, like mm. back when like oh, wow. there weren't newspaper apps even, right? I, oh, I mean, like, that was not that far like back really, but it was long enough ago that yeah. the whole landscape has changed. And I imagine with that, you know, photography's role is morphing mm. and evolving. Can you speak to maybe like, I don't know if it came up in like classes or in these literal spaces of the newspapers were you asked to show up differently from year to year like what kind of I don't know mm. what I'm asking exactly but just the evolution of newspaper photography from your vantage point yeah totally that's that is actually a good question and I do feel like I was lucky to get to experience a lot of different types of newspaper visual journalism so one, it, it, for me, I don't think it was as much over time, but it was in the different types of newspapers. So in the smallest community paper in Jasper, Indiana, it was a county of 40,000 that we covered and we had an afternoon paper. We had a photo staff, at one point, a photo staff of four for this tiny community paper, which was amazing. So we got a lot of time and freedom to explore. And in that county, the pace of life was so much slower and we really had an opportunity to take our time on assignments. We were never rushing and we were never filing on deadline. We always had time and because it was an afternoon paper, it was printed in the morning, which means that anything we photographed the previous day, we had that whole day to work on and then file before we went to bed basically. And so yeah, that, but that basically means you're never on deadline and you're never rushing, which is huge for, for growing at a newspaper. Yeah. And so that space, it also matched the, like I said, the pace of life there in, in that community. And so it felt like, and, and, and that also photographing for the paper was basically all that we were expected to do. We were occasionally expected to file images or to, to text images to the editor to post to Instagram while we were at an event, but that was rare. And we were not asked to do video and we were not asked to do, to be sending photos while we were at assignments. We were not asked to rush back to the office and file. We were never working from the field on a laptop. So it was like a very pure form 
of the job. And then compared to interning at the Washington Post um, in a big city, fast pace of life, fast environment in a lot of ways, the, the, it, it wasn't for every assignment, but sometimes I was expected or expected to be on deadline filing as soon as possible, filing from the field, working on a laptop. So like photographing the 4th of July fireworks in DC, um, I had a laptop set up right next to where I had my tripod and everything set up to photograph the fireworks. And the deadline was as soon as possible. And it was expected that I would file photos within minutes, ideally, like I mean, ideally seconds of <laughs> like taking the photos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's like just a total, totally different environment, totally different way of working. So, um, and also to be hotspotting my phone and yeah, just, just sending photos from the field as soon as possible a lot of the time. And not, not all the time. I definitely had a mix of assignments and a lot of time that I did get to spend with people and not on deadline, but that immediacy versus taking as long as you need, just like totally separate environment. So I feel like that kind of speaks to the evolution of news and visuals in news a little bit. Um, just, just one thing that I definitely noticed a lot in my internships. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I imagine for a lot of people, maybe one will feel more comfortable than the other or be there. Yeah. I think to experience both anyway mm -hmm. um, is really cool for how you get to show up to different assignments with the different expectations that they might carry um, mm -hmm. makes me curious about. So in the um, industry of photojournalism, is it traditional to be on staff at this point for people or is it more traditional to be um, freelance? Like, is there a, a norm or is there this spectrum of variety? I don't know. Yeah, I think there is still a little bit of both, but the trend that I've noticed is a lot less staff positions and more people freelancing. And so I think I can't even totally speak to this because I haven't seen a longer period of time in the newspaper industry, but I know that when I talk to professors or people who've worked in newspapers longer, it seems like around 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, there was just so many more staff positions. And then at newspapers and as papers have sold and downsized and folded and just shrunk overall, the, the photographer staff positions have not be, um, have not really stuck around as much. So photographers coming out of our, our, the programs and the grad program I was at, a lot more alumni I'm seeing as uh, freelancers and doing some of their work focused on photojournalism and documentary photography and then some focused on commercial work that is uh, that you know makes a lot more money and just kind of more of a balance of of work so yeah so interesting and I appreciate the chance to understand it better um yeah. and it brings us to so um, you were in grad school, you've done all these internships. Now you are a resident of Northern California doing your photography thing there. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I moved after, so after those internships, I did go back to the community paper in Indiana and in Jasper for a, a year and a half and I was on staff there. So that was, that was really awesome to get to experience a staff position at a paper that had that much time and resources. And so I did that for a year and a half. And then at the end of 2020, um, moved to California and started freelancing. So that was a big, definitely a big step, but um, it was also one that I was really excited to take to be back in a place that I have family and friends and more connections personally. So, um, and yeah, freelancing has been, it's been pretty great. I started, when I first got here and I was in San Francisco, I was doing a lot of work for the Chronicle and the San Francisco Chronicle and some other publications that I had had connections with those editors before. And then last fall, I realized that I really needed to take a little break from um, just from the grind of freelancing and, and kind of rethink the directions that I wanted to go as a photographer. And then so I ended up taking a couple of months off and borrowing a friend's van and doing a van trip around California, partly inspired. I mean, maybe 
subconsciously <laughs> or maybe consciously inspired by uh, our friends Kate and Tom who did their 50 yes. States road trip. And, and then now, so after that time, um, I feel a little more clear on kind of where I want to go as a photographer, still figuring that out very much so, but I'm back in Oakland and have started freelancing again. So yeah, it's really, it's really great to be in the Bay and really enjoying the the community here. Yeah. I think that that's such a cool strength to be willing to be like flexible with figuring it out and taking like steps back and like just enjoying Mm -hmm. the journey. Um, I'm also like not surprised if their road trip has inspired many people's other road trips yeah. because it is so cool um yeah. and so it, it's great to hear of that ripple effect of you then taking a road trip in your totally. in totally. your <laughs> that's so fun um and I think um you know it your journey is really cool how you did have these staff experiences and then this freelancing I imagine mm-hmm. um and you kind of talked about it before we got on here of like that network being really helpful to have established before you know, taking on your like separate identity as a freelancer. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's cool to continue to see how that kind of weaves in to the work that you do and and where it ends up. I was reading your website and you describe yourself as a visual storyteller, which I think is such a beautiful way to um, put your words what it is that you do. And I think it's maybe a good um, kind of segue for us to understand a bit more about your work style and your approach to photography. Um, within this photojournalism, maybe kind of bigger picture. Yeah, totally. Um, I, so are you kind of asking about where I'm at now with? Yeah, if you could, um, I guess maybe um, your um, style or how you, um, the things that the projects you gravitate towards, like anything in that realm. Totally. Yeah. So I, I think during my time in the internships and graduate school the the type of work I was really drawn to was doing intimate these like kind of intimate human stories and just spending time with people um is is one way to do that and like to to be able to develop a rapport with them and develop trust with them so that you can just be in their lives and just observe while they're doing their life and so that takes a lot of trust and can't time to build those connections with with the people you photograph and then so that that was kind of the the type of work that I was most drawn to and 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 trying to do within the newspapers anytime I could um and I think that work is really beautiful because it just shows like what I guess what I'm trying to show through that is just at the at the basic level like what is their life like and what is their daily life like and and the point of that for me I think is to help the viewer understand and ideally build empathy with that person and their life but I do think on a kind of more broad level as we talked about connection like that I think just seeing another person and seeing what their life is like helps build that connection so I think that's what I'm kind of most drawn to do at at some level with my work um and then I think as I've shifted into my time freelancing and have had a little more time and space to think about it, I'm also interested in stories that kind of come from what I care about and the issues I care about uh, personally as well as kind of professionally and academically. So, um, so I think in addition to telling these more intimate personal stories that are issue based about poverty or housing or addiction or PTSD or whatever it is that I've been kind of drawn to working on. I think also for me and my life and my background in Alaska, I'm also interested in these stories about the outdoors and nature and just people out, people enjoying nature through outdoor recreation and all these different things. So I think those are kind of two things that I'm holding and figuring out how I'm going to kind of be able to do both or let, you know, let things just unfold as they do. Yeah. I'll be excited to continue to see the ways that you really masterfully do combine these both um, passions and, and skill sets. Um, In the field of social work, we think a lot about 
the way that we show up to different situations. And so a lot of our coursework is about you know, how do you effectively like build rapport with a, a stranger, right? Who you're hoping to be partnered with in some way towards a goal mm -hmm. that they have, or, you know, how do we show someone's strengths or extend like dignity to the situation while also advocating and, and like shedding light on everything that's going wrong in your, like, I think that it's really cool how you've honed in on this importance of how you connect with the, the subject of the work, right. And how you tell their story. Is that something that comes from the school education of photojournalism? Is that something that comes from, you know, just the experiences that you've had the chance to accumulate? Are there like rules of engagement in photojournalism? What is that like? Yeah, good questions. I think that I, we have, we did talk a lot about that in school and through, I had a mentor at a graduate assistant position in at OU that that talked a lot about that with me and just how basically how to navigate those spaces and how to build that trust with people so it, it did come from school and then I think more so as in a more personal experience way just on the internships and getting to developing that confidence to talk to anyone and to have a way of communicating kind of what you're asking and why most importantly why you're asking it um, to be able to explain to somebody why you why their story is important why you want to spend this time with them why you want to make their pictures and um and just to be able to communicate those things clearly um I think came from experience in the internships yeah that makes sense I think that um in those situations like it is important to be able to convey your sincerity yeah. and sincerity and your intentions. And that does take a lot of like personal practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then like figuring out like what kind of jives well for you, like for this platform, totally. I mean, like I much prefer to email people, even if I've gone to their gallery in person or, you know, seen them in person, like, I just want you to read first what I'm doing mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. talk to me for you. Is there anything that's like kind of a signature part of your approach to working mm -hmm. with a new person? Do you always lead the same way or what's that like? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know if I've been asked that before. Let me think for a second. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I gen I think a big part and and this kind of depends on the person, but if there is resistance to being photographed in like a I don't think my story is important, I don't think I'm important way. Like I definitely met that a lot on different newspaper things, especially in working in these smaller communities where the smallest stories matter and it doesn't really matter if somebody yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter what it's about at the community journalism level, everything's important and everyone's story is important. And that's, I think, why it's so, why it was so impactful to work in those communities, because it allowed me the opportunity to practice seeing that in everyone I interacted with and to, to be able to understand that everyone has a story worth telling and it's just up to me to figure out how to tell it, kind of. Um, so I think whenever I did meet that resistance, of my story is not important I'm not important I don't want to like put myself out there in that way yes of course respecting that and and hearing that and you know kind of meeting the person where they're at and then I think for me it was also a practice of being able to explain why I did think their story was important and why the community would appreciate seeing it and learning about it and so I think being able to communicate just why what I saw in their story that felt like worth sharing to me. That's yeah. awesome. I think it's kind of a full circle back to the psychology too of like you understanding yeah. that bigger picture of the system and the environment, totally. how every other person could um, have that their own ripple effect from that person's story like you have with Tom and Kate and the van and your journey. And um, that's really, that's awesome. I appreciate you kind of going down that rabbit hole with me. Um, totally. So um, I think we've built up some good anticipation to actually see some of your work. So I will pull up my screen and we can talk to some of your more specific projects. So um, from your website, I pulled some different moments that you have mm -hmm. photographed. Um, I can't wait to hear a little bit more about what's going on in each one and like how you're choosing 
to click the button <laughs> to snap the picture when you do because it's really beautiful yeah totally yeah so these are some these are some kind of single images or moments from different newspaper settings that I was in. So the top one is Coco Goff. At the time, she was a 15-year-old competing in the city open a tennis tournament in DC. So I took this image on my summer internship at the Post. And I think one reason I think this made the made the website is that I like the kind of graphic, unique nature of the image. And it is a it is a sports action photo, but I think to me it has this element of my own vision in it and, and a unique way of seeing a, of a tennis serve, basically. So I, yeah, I think I was really drawn to just the, the graphicness and that it seemed like a unique way to see a tennis court and way to see a tennis serve. Yeah. Yes, I would like see this one on the wall of a home too right like in mm. a special like it's so artistic um with the gr the color blocking in the background mm. and i'm throwing these turns around like i know what i'm talking about but there's like a chunk yeah of oh yeah, yeah. I think that's really cool <laughs> um and then like the like, dynamic like nature of her like in front of, i just it's so breathtaking so that's awesome thank you appreciate yeah. it yeah yeah and i mean also you said the asked kind of how to know when to take the photo at that time I think to me that what made me think of is just the editing process and so um and also I'll I'll just clarify this for anyone who might be hearing this when photographers or photojournalists say editing they mean the photo selection process mm -hmm. and then toning refers to tweaking the color and contrast and everything on the image so people people use the word editing a lot to mean toning but I will, I will just put that out there. So um, yeah, so the editing process in selecting this photo, I think is where that comes in more. And uh, because it, it's just specifically in sports, we're taking a lot of photos and then kind of only after you're going through and selecting the exact moment, because it's kind of hard to see when you're taking the photo, which moment, which like micro moment is going to be the photo. So I think in, I did, when I was making this picture, this, I was trying to, to do this and trying to create a graphic photo. And then I think only in the editing process after was I able to select the specific frame and the specific frame with her hair at that angle and her hand totally not unobstruct or unobstructed by the white lines and getting the tennis ball in the frame too. You know, there was plenty of, with the tennis ball out of the frame. So that a lot of that comes into play in the editing process while framing it and setting it up, you know, in the moment. That's so cool. And there's so many different logistics to it. I'm wondering about, um, so you're at this internship, you get this word that you're gonna go photograph this tennis event. Is there mm -hmm. much planning in advance for the photos you're hoping to capture? Or is it like a, day of I'm there I'm gonna start feeling out where I want to like be perched what what's that like yeah so the approach to a lot of newspaper assignments and sports as well is to get your kind of basic photos and and meet your basic needs of the assignment and then go play and get more creative so at a tennis event or any sports event for example get the kind of basic standard sh standard shots that your editor is expecting to see are ac action photos of every athlete in the match and overall photos of the scene and then details of the of the players and of the fans and just you're kind of trying to tell tell the story visually so yeah the action photos and scene setters of where you are fans reacting and then also athletes' reactions and those moments at the end of the game. And so the, and it kind of depends on each thing that you're photographing, like what, what the basic flow is, but that, for example, for a tennis match is kind of the basic needs. And then beyond that and kind of within that, you're also looking for the special kind of more creative moments and maybe more graphic pictures or special reactions or fans dressed up in a specific way and you're, you're kind of looking for the unique things about that day that tell the story that's so um such an interesting insight uh, so thank you yeah. and 
Um, so I chose all these cause they were kind of just like feminine energy, but like in mm. so many different ways. And I would love to like maybe either one of the next two, whichever you prefer yeah. to next. Yeah, totally. Um, the, oh, I also, I love that. That's why you chose these things. Um, yeah, I love that. <laughs> the heels on the bottom left are, that's Nancy Pelosi's feet at a press conference in, on, uh, in Capitol Hill on my summer internship in DC. So I think that was a fun example. I was with a a uh, Washington Post photographer that day who she had she has been working on the hill for decades and so she was kind of showing me around that day and helping me figure out where to go and what you know what to do so that was awesome to have somebody to kind of shadow that day in a place like the hill and so she another thing too when you're in these political environments is you're trying to look for the unique details that are a little different than the basic photos so again it kind of is the same flow of the tennis event where you're trying to meet the basic needs of the event and so you're getting photos of Nancy Pelosi speaking and the room and any kind of the reactions of the people she's speaking to and you're just kind of getting these more literal photos of what's going on and then after that you give yourself a little time to play and explore and look for the unique details um and then also and also during that you're you're looking for the unique photos within the basic photos but the heels crossed um as she's speaking behind the podium to me was this kind of little moment that spoke more to her what kind of what was going on with her internally and in her inner moment and just that like body language tells so much about about people so I think that was kind of what I was looking for within the event oh my gosh it's incredibly intimate actually because mm. I guess you don't necessarily see that from the front vantage point right and then there's so many people right. focused on raising their hand or focused on like picking at whatever word she says they're missing all of this is happening you know, below the surface. Totally. And that's, that's amazing um, that you were able to think on your feet like that and get to that mm. her literal feet. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. And so the final one here is a whole different sort of situation. What's happening? Yeah. So this was actually at the Women's March in DC in 2017. I was in grad school and went to the women's march to to photograph it and so this was a pretty early image for me and one of the first kind of events I'd covered in grad school um and I think at that point it was great because in grad school I'm not and at that time I wasn't on assignment for anyone and I wasn't I wasn't on deadline it was really just an opportunity to learn and to start learning how to document events and news and so I think at that point too, I was trying to focus on more unique moments and kind of quieter moments within a big loud event like the Women's March. So I think I was much more drawn towards this, towards the quiet. And so I saw at one point, uh, there was a lot of people ch chanting and yelling and, um, and marching a lot of signs and yeah, a lot of yelling. And so I think this moment was when uh, Trump's motorcade was going to be passing through this big group of marchers and so and this woman kind of um, amongst all the yelling and chanting closed her eyes and, and took this quiet moment to herself and so I was I just saw that and was really was really drawn to it visually and and made this picture and then of course after I talked to her and you know asked her if it was okay and got her name so yeah that's so cool. So um, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I was like, I wanted to ask you about what that's like if she knows this photo exists, but I, mm. I didn't know if that was an okay, um, <laughs> I didn't know if that was an okay question, but yeah. um, so what was that like going up to her afterward? Like, is it weird? Like, hey, I just took a photo of you because <laughs> it was really cool. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, totally. I think um, at first when I started doing this, it was it's definitely a little scary to to do that but yeah that now I'm, I feel very comfortable doing that and that's that's pretty much it what I say I'm like oh excuse me I'm 
I usually introduce myself really quickly. I'm a photographer, I'm working for XYZ publication, or I'm a, I'm a graduate student doing photography and I'm covering this march. I just took this photo of you, is that okay? And if they say yes, then I ask for their name. And I don't really think, I, I've, I haven't had that many people say no, or so, some people after I explain that, don't want to give their name or don't want to be in XYZ publication. Um, and that's totally fine. And I'm like, great. And there's no, you know, there's no issue. Um, but is that, that also is something we covered a lot in school are legal rights as photographers, because if you're in a public space, you are legally allowed to photograph anyone. And that doesn't mean that they have to give you their name, but you, um, if it's a public event and I take a photo of someone, um, if even if they don't want it in the publication legally, it is okay to to publish it. But we we don't usually do that. We try to you know get people's permission. But that's just like something good to know at, on the on the legal side of it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's such an important consideration um, for anyone that has a camera. And so I appreciate right. you sharing what you've um, been able to learn in that space. Yeah, of course. So the next one here um, is a little different in that all the photos are part of the same project, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, um, this was really powerful reading about it, but now I can't wait to hear from your voice, you know, what was going on. Yeah, so this was a portrait project, a diptych series, and, and that means kind of two photos together uh for the Washington Post about the Dixie Fire in California that uh the town of Greenville was burned basically burned to the ground and the whole town evacuated and so this project was kind of going and asking the people who had evacuated from Greenville what were the objects that they took with them when they evacuated and so and then doing a photo of them and then a photo of the things that they took with them. And the idea behind this project was to get at, was to, to tell the story in a different way, the, t the story of evacuating, of people having to evacuate their homes. And we thought it'd be interesting just again, to kind of get at this question of like, what is their life like? What is it like to have to evacuate one's home and to take with them what, what they, care about and so me and an editor I think we kind of both came up with the idea I think maybe even it was more her idea and then I and she was kind of asking me if that was something I'd be excited about and something I'd be interested in and she was also open to other ideas of kind of creative storytelling uh with this assignment and so we yeah we worked together to kind of come up with this vision and then I went ahead and did it. So it was, we went out with a reporter to the town that was close to the town that burned and basically went and found these evacuees and interviewed them, recorded the audio, uh, did their portraits and then photographed some of the objects that they took with them. Wow, I think um, what stands out to me, I mean, there's so much that stands out to me with this. Um, one of the points being that there was this like pre-planning of how the creative was gonna come together mm. with Diptych and stuff like that. Um, and the fact that you were involved in that planning process with the, um, was it the editor? I'm sorry, I don't the know. Editor, yeah. yeah, the mm -hmm. editor. But at the same time, like this was a natural disaster, right? Like things happen kind of quickly. Like mm -hmm. how long was the timeline of actually, you know, having the idea of how the story would be told to going and taking the photos? Because yeah, totally. So, I mean, even to share a little more of how that came together. So I had, when the Dixie Fire first hit, this editor who, again, I had worked with in DC, reached out to me and asked if I'd be available to cover the actual fire and to go out with the fire crews and the fire suits and document the flames basically. And I don't have a fire suit or really enough training to be able to do that. And so I told her that I'm not gonna risk any, you know, no, no need to risk safety with that. And that and that's also not really something that I'm super interested in. There are other people who do that, who do a great job and make beautiful photos and kind of enjoy that a lot more so I told her you know I wasn't available I wasn't available for that but I would be 
available in the coming weeks for any aftermath stories if she wanted that. And so she did reach back out to me. I think I was doing this about a week after the fire, the town was evacuated sometime around that. The, and this was last August. And so, yeah, so I was doing, so that was kind of the initial planning for, for like how her and I were working together on this. Um, and I forget what else you asked. <laughs> no, you're good. This is really yeah. interesting kind of backstory that I didn't even know was going to be there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. we were thinking about, you know, the timeline for these projects, because there was a degree of, um, creative like strategy, it sounds like, but also this is happening in real time. People are being evacuated. So it sounds there was at least a week of time where like where you guys were thinking about it and, and figuring out how you're going to get there. Is that right? Or was there more that went into the, the timeline? Yeah. So I think it was, I think it was about a week after, I forget when she reached out to me, but when I went to the town and went and found these folks with the reporter, they had been evacuated. For, yeah. They had been evacuated for about a week. And I think at that point I had had a couple days notice on what I was going to be doing, how long I'd be spending there and, you know, who I'd be working with. So I think the, the time between she, her suggesting we take this approach and me doing it was a couple days. And, um, but, and I think to me, because I had done some similar projects like this and portraiture, environmental portraiture, like these portraits are, and then I could, I could see it really clearly as she said it. And I thought that that would be a really cool approach. So I was on board pretty quickly and then um, just, yeah, went, went ahead and did it. <laughs> so, and that I was obviously not quite as simple. It ended up being uh, a bit hard to find some of the, it, it took us a couple of days to find enough folks to make this portrait series feel complete and get a range of ages, genders, um, ethnicities, et cetera. So. Yeah. yeah and, and objects as well um, so I think we ended up doing I forget what I think it was 12 people in the series um so that kind of felt like a good number but yeah I am I'm thinking about you know you going to this place after this the when these fires are happening versus going to that tennis match right like right <laughs> to show up in a way that's I I'm perceiving is so different for mm -hmm. one thing versus the other. Could you speak to, you know, what it felt like to be in this place doing photography while these people are like, you know, navigating so many things that are hitting them at once? Yeah, definitely. It, it definitely felt pretty heavy, this assignment uh, specifically. I haven't covered too many natural disasters or aftermath of natural disasters, but it is really, really emotional. And they, these people are going through so much and they're, um, you know, the people who, are agreeing to speak with us. I think it's pretty, it is very raw for them. And so show, it feels very important to me to show up in a very kind of open and empathetic state and also to have time to do these projects because there's nothing worse than like interviewing somebody basically about the worst day of their life and feeling like you're rushing to get somewhere or rushing them to tell their story because that just isn't fair at all. And, and, and to, to, it feels more pushy and uh and invasive when you're rushing them um so i doing a project like this definitely took time so i'm forgetting exactly how many days i think we had at least three days in uh in the town we were in of quincy um the reporter was ended up even being a little more rushed and she was working on a couple different stories but i was able to um to have the time that i needed and and that also requires working with editors who kind of are on board with the vision and who understand what you're trying to do and who know that it takes time to get these types of, uh, these types of stories done. Yeah, I think that's really yeah. helpful context. Um, and I'm curious about um, the like portraiture of these people, like how much direction was involved? Like, how do you approach that? Um, and they, they, they all have a lot of dignity. I, I think that that's really cool. Mm. Yeah, totally. I think for a story like this, my 
working with the reporter, like we, our approach would kind of be to, you know, find the people, ask if they're okay to talk to us, explain what, what we're doing, and then uh, ask if we can interview them. And so in a story like this, it, it makes, it always makes more sense for me to start with the interview and to build that rapport with them and build that trust. And you build a lot of trust just by listening. And then once we're done with the interview, I ask to, to photograph them and also that when, when the reporter is leading the interview, it gives me a little time to think about what, where I would like to photograph them, kind of think of the visuals. And then also they're telling the reporter about what it was that they saved. And so then I'm thinking about which objects would make sense to photograph and oh, which ones do they have? And so I'm, do they have with them now? And I'm just kind of listening to all those things and then getting a sense of what I want to do with the photos. And so then I would kind of direct them to where I thought would be a good photo and listen to them if they had any ideas of where they want to be photographed. And some of these were kind of, this was the, what felt like the only setting. So the upper right woman who had uh, saved, this was a traditional indigenous baby basket that I think her grandmother had woven for her when she was an infant. Um, so we interviewed her, or I actually, I think I interviewed her just just me in a part in a good little parking lot or something and so it was a super cluttered space and I, that was just where it made sense for us to meet up with her and I'd been connected with her over the phone so met up with her in a parking lot and so I was kind of drawn to her sit and interviewed her actually like sitting right there in her car and so it also to me spoke to this to the fact that she was didn't have a home and she was spending more time in her car and had evacuated in her car so I was I was drawn to her car. So some of them were what I was thinking would be good. And some of them were just where we were with the person, if that makes sense. And then just with the objects, basically my goal was to try to get a very clean background and to have them holding it in front of a nice blank space and not in a super cluttered environment. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's cool how you had that built in time when the um, reporter yeah. was doing their thing and like all those different ways that the pieces fit together um, perfectly as they need to um, works out really well. Totally. You're, so you wrote parts of the story or you also did some writing on this piece? Did I you I didn't end up writing anything, but I did get, I my name was on the byline because I ended up leading or do, doing uh maybe half or more than half of the interviews when the reporter ended up having to go back to Reno and she was working on a, a different story. And so then it was, so so we did have that time where it was both of us. And then also it was, a lot of it was just me doing the interview and the photos. So, yeah. Do you have any, um, you know, memories maybe that stand out and it's okay if you don't, of when you were leading those interviews, maybe? Um. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know if this is quite what you're asking, but it does. It, it is, uh, it was a pretty intense environment to be working in and um, very emotional, very heavy. I mean, a lot of these interviews, like I end up, they end up crying, I end up crying. Like it's, it's very like uh, emotional. It can be very emotional. Um, and actually, yeah, I do have one, you know, one, interview that really stuck with me was this person who just had this complete radical acceptance of what had happened and basically he evacuated uh and had had his car packed up outside his house and then I'm sorry he he packed up his car he was still in the town of Rainville he left the town to go run an errand and was going to come right back but when he tried to go back they wouldn't let him back in and that was when the town actually burned so even though he had packed up his car with all his stuff he lost everything and had literally only the clothes on his back and like his keys and a truck but that was it to me a kind of a story that obviously sounds really heartbreaking and it is in a lot of ways but he had this total 
beautiful acceptance outlook on it. And it was just like, they're just things I, you know, I have myself and here I am and I can get new things. And even though there were a lot of sentimental, priceless, irreplaceable things that he had in his car, he just had this, this total acceptance of it. And so I think that story definitely sticks with me from this. And it was like, yeah, just a beautiful, it's just a beautiful person to learn from. I think that's the best descriptor, a beautiful person and frame of mind and all of the things. Um, that's so cool that that story gets to impact each of us because of that moment and that, totally. that conversation. Um, so thank you for, um, you know, really fully exploring this one with me. Uh, yeah, you caught course. my eye. This also so cool and maybe a little closer to where you started <laughs> your journey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's called, was it two days, 10 dogs, 150 miles? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a story that I got to do for the New York Times and about the junior I did rod, which is a dog mushing race in uh, outside of Anchorage area in Alaska. So um, takes place in Kinnick and is it, yeah, it's a, it's a two day dog mushing event for teenagers. Um, and I was really lucky to get to the story uh, knowing the editor at the New York, the sports editor, sports photo editor at the New York Times. And he asked if I'd be interested in doing the story. It was something that him and a designer had heard of and thought would make a really great sports feature story. And then he knew that I was wanting to do, to do work in Alaska and asked if, yeah, asked if I could do it. So I was thrilled to get to do it. And this, I, the approach that we took was basically um, documenting the event and the race and then also spending time with some of the mushers before the race to get to see what it's like to tend to the dogs and then um, also just looking for uh, looking for details and unique scenes along the race like the northern lights photo at the bottom right at the end of the race and like the the uh, license plate about dog mushing they, those little details and the big details like the Northern Lights yeah. are so, um, so impactful um, and so cool. And I think um, I can see where the dynamic of caring for the dogs comes in. Like mm. the one that was not, I didn't put on the screen here, but I think that there was a dog and their human, like kind of like face mm. to face mm -hmm. or something that was really, totally. really precious. Had this been a event that you were aware of that you had ever been to before, or did you come in kind of and, you know, even though you had lived in Alaska as like kind of a fresh face. Yeah, I, yeah, so I grew up in Southeast Alaska, so it looks nothing like this landscape. It's, it's all, um, yeah, trees and just ocean and a totally different landscape. So I am not as, was not as familiar at all with dog mushing. There's not dog mushing really in Alaska, except for kind of tourism, but it's not something that locals are doing much of. So this was really new to me. And so I wanted to make sure to kind of learn as much as I could about it and also as much about how to photograph it as I could because it's in low temperatures and there's a whole other set of considerations uh, with photographing the cold, like battery life and, um, and you know, keeping my hands warm and getting the right footwear and clothing and all that. So I, before, before I went, did a lot of research ahead of time, reaching out to photographers in the area, different photographers who'd covered dog mushing, um, and then also talking to the race coordinator and interviewing her ahead of time about what the, what the race is about for them, what it's about for her, and asking her for a specific mushers that might be good to interview or highlight while I'm there and just getting a, as much of a picture as I could before I went knowing that it would be a really packed two days of the race and I would need to be kind of ready to go when I got there. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. for two days of like the active, like capturing photos, how much, this was a longer preparation process. Mm -hmm. It seems like, right. How yes, long is you getting yeah. ready for this project? I think I, I think I had about a month of notice before going. And then, you know, in those last two weeks, a lot of the detail before I went, a lot of the details were coming together as far as the access that I would get, if I would be able to, to get a ride or flight out to the midpoint, um, how, you know, how those decisions would be made 
who I would be relying on for rides and uh and gear and stuff like that so I think it was it felt like a kind of rush two weeks at the end of, of all those details coming together because it's it's such a bigger thing at the same time also I was dealing with COVID preparations because uh this was last February and the state of Alaska required you know either a quarantine period or you had to have show that you had recovered from COVID and have a doctor's note and all this stuff. So dealing with COVID preparations and how that was going to go. And then also the, the logistics of the race. So yeah, this compared to the fire story, this took a lot more preparation and logistics and coordinating with the people involved in the race. It seems like it, um, but it's so worth it. This is such a cool yeah, lens. Totally. That the majority of the world will never get to see if, if not for people like you showing up and telling the story. Um, makes me think of, so um, I had the chance to speak with a, um, a someone who dances like ballet on here. And we talked about there being, you know, certain um, key um, like dances that you want to be able to do in your career. Are there any like, events or things that you hope to be able to mm. photograph as part of your um time in this profession mm. that's a good question i think a co i think more places come to mind mm. would let, definitely like to do more work in alaska and tell more tell more stories in alaska and then also my mom is australian and I grew up getting to go to Australia a little bit when I was younger. And so I think, and I haven't been since I was in middle school. So I think that's another place I would like to explore and do stories in and even explore some more personal connections and personal history within Australia and, and my mom's side of the family. So um, yeah, I think those are some, some places that come to mind. So cool. I'll be waiting to um, see yeah. them celebrate those works as they become realities. Um, I'd love to pull up now. I'll pass over the screen sharing to you um, for some yes. recent projects that do um, are close to your heart. Yeah. Awesome. Wait, is this working? Yes, I can see it. Awesome. So this was a story that published in the travel section of the Washington Post last fall. And it was a trip that I got to take with my family to Gates of the Arctic National Park. And we did a 10 day canoe trip, canoe camping trip, and through um, 8.4 million, million acres of wilderness. And so it's, it's the least visited national park. So it was a really, really awesome opportunity to spend time in nature and wilderness. And my dad is an outdoor guide and has been a guide for, uh, I think, decades um I think 35 plus years in Alaska and so we were really I felt really lucky to get to go on this family trip and have him guide us through the wilderness and so Gates of the Arctic National Park is uh really far north in Alaska it's above the Arctic Circle and so it took us to plane ride a flight to Fairbanks in the interior on a jet and then two small flight float plane rides uh, to get out into this river. And so we were dropped off uh, on this little float plane at this little lake with all our stuff and our food and our gear. And then we had had 10 days out in the wilderness with no cell phone service, no connection to the outdoor world besides a satellite phone in case of emergencies. Um, and we're just among, amongst the tundra and the river and all this beautiful wildlife. So this is a photo of my dad here doing some yoga. And, I love uh, it. <laughs> and the oh, that's like my favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's great. He actually doesn't really like this photo and couldn't believe that it made the cut and could not believe that the photo editors selected it for the <laughs> final story, but uh, I love it. So um, yeah, and then here's some, some bird tracks in the riverbank. Um, and just a little bit more about this place the it's so far north and we were there during the summer solstice that the sun never went down and so it was light for 24 hours that was really cool to experience and the sun just kind of went around the sky but never yeah never dipped lower than the horizon line um and then 
um, got to see some cool, this is the fox along the riverbank wow. while we're here in our canoes and then uh, some uh, ptarmigan nests and grizzly bear tracks. Um, we also got to do some fishing and uh, I got to eat the, you know, cook the fish on the fire and eat it right there. And then this is a photo of uh, my mom in the plane on the flight out. So yeah, the story was really, I think, pretty special for me to get to do uh, a personal story and, and get a chance to explore that outdoor recreation that I was talking about and kind of do stories about that. Yeah, it's um, such a beautiful like memory too that you get to share with your family. Did you totally. know when you were going on the trip that it would ultimately be um, a published like um, photojournalism story? Okay, so you entered it knowing that, was this the first time that your family was part of one of the photos that like the projects that you worked on or have they been in the newspaper because of you before? No, this was, yeah, this was the first one. And actually they, I went I hadn't actually pitched this to the editor yet and like it wasn't agreed upon, but I went approached approached this trip just by myself with the intention to pitch it to a travel publication. Um, and so I it was only after the trip happened that I and I edited through my photos and put together a pitch and sent it out to the editors and then they agreed to it. So there wasn't, I guess. There wasn't a guarantee that it would get ex accepted anywhere, um, but that was just the way I approached it. And my family, yeah, they, I guess, agreed to, <laughs> agreed to it. I think they're, at this point, they're pretty used to being photographed. They had not been in a publication before, though. So that was, that was also fun as a family to, to kind of <laughs> experience that. It was a that. moment. Um, yeah. Did it feel any different or maybe it felt exactly the same, you know, photographing your family versus these people that you get to know kind of on the fly and on your yeah, family vacation. <laughs> totally. It does. Yeah. It does feel different when I'm photographing my family, basically because I already have that trust with them. And like, I know that they just, I, I kind of know that they're fine with me photographing them um, in any moment pretty much so um and I'm and because I'm so used to photographing them um yeah they they just are, are used to it I guess um so I don't yeah I don't feel like I have to like build that trust with them because it's already there yeah. yeah so um I imagine you know with people whose art ends up in galleries right they have this chance to watch people react to it your work is a little different in that it ends up in newspapers that maybe people consume in the comfort of their home or, you know, on a screen that's mm -hmm. not very pretty. I guess you could stand at a newsstand and watch people look at the photos, but um, have you had a chance to experience people's reactions to your work or maybe even just in this case, like your family? Like, what was that like for you? Totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you bring this up, actually. That for me is always a huge part of this work uh is is the feedback and like the, re the the reaction and so and that's such a big that's such a big part of this process for me and not it's not the case for all photographers that they are looking for that piece but yeah for for me it's about it's about the connection you know capturing someone's story communicating it to other viewers and then having the feedback of both the person that was in the story and then the readers and their reaction and that like that completing that look for me I think is also what motivates me to keep going with this because if you don't see how people react to it then it's like yeah like that's the, that's the purpose for me is the sharing and so and and making sure that people kind of see it <laughs> so um so yeah I think with this story and then it's interesting because working in the community settings you see that you get that feedback a lot just by being out in the community and people approach you and oh I saw your I saw the story in this or like wow I really loved that photos on this thing and you're kind of getting that feedback just by being in the place working for national publications it's not really the same because readers are all over the country and it, the feedback comes more digitally. So in the comment sections or emails, sometimes I get emails or 
in this case, my family getting emails or, you know, my family sending it out to their friends and family and hearing those responses. So, um, but yeah, for national publications overall, and I think even for the junior I did read story, it, there's, you know, you get, you get feedback of all kinds in the comment sections <laughs> of the, of the stories. So that's, that's one way to get the feedback. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Is there, so you just kind of, you mentioned that you get all sorts of feedback and I absolutely believe that that's the case. People say the darndest yeah. things um, on all sides yeah. of that spectrum. Is there a way that you, you know, keep it a healthy process for yourself to receive that feedback? Like, do you enter a certain frame of mind? Do you <laughs> tell yeah. yourself some positive phrase? <laughs> like, what is, what is that like for you? That's a good question. Um, I think usually I mean, overall, I feel, I feel like the starting at that community level and was a really good place to like kind of learn how that feedback feels mm -hmm. and how that works and to understand that stories will be received in a lot of different ways. And it's okay if people don't receive it in the way that you kind of were hoping that they would and, and that that's, that's just part of it too. Um, and just to know, I think that's part of just like putting your work out in the public. It's just knowing that some people will get what you were trying to communicate and we'll see, see it kind of exactly as you'd hope. Some people will get some totally different, but such a beautiful way of receiving it. Some people will see it in maybe a more negative light than you intended it. And that's okay. And you just kind of have to learn to not let that affect you because that's like their own experience of the world. So. I don't know if I'm yes. uh, great at doing that all the time or if, if this makes sense, but yeah. Also, should I stop sharing my screen? Yeah, you're perfect. You can, um, you can do that. But yeah, no, I think that's very valid um, that it's going to always be a process for us. And some days yeah. if we're less well-rested and more, totally. you know, uh, just generally feeling kind of blah, it's going to be harder than others. But um, yeah. all in all, I think it's really cool that you um, look forward to that feedback and to the engagement back and forth and um, wanting people to have a chance to let your work be a, um, like a starting point for them to realize they do have opinions about things. Totally. Like that's cool too. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. So as we are, you know, nearing, um, the end, I like to get a little bit more abstract again and just ask some like sort of more rapid fire, but uh, still kind of meandering <laughs> questions, um, to you. So the first one being, you know, from your perspective, why does photog documentary photography specifically um, matter? What keeps inspiring and motivating you to show up and do this work? Yeah, um, I think I just feel the call to spread that connection through photos. I think it's just, yeah, all about connecting. And um, I think, yeah, I think, I think it matters because visuals are such a, you know, we talk about this being a universal language and people, it kind of visuals transcending language and transcending other ways of communicating. And so to be able to see a photo and learn something about that person or that place um, without, yeah, without any other things affecting it, I think is really beautiful. Um, so I think I, yeah, I, I think just at the core, it's a, it's about connection. And I think that's why it matters. Yeah. Yes. Um, big fan of connection of myself. So yeah. Really wonderful. Um, are there any lessons you've learned along the way or wisdom that's been meaningful to you that you, um, think other people could benefit from who want to keep learning about this craft or be creative or just try something that they're passionate about? Yeah. Good question. Um, I think, I think to just learn as much as you can to, to try to engage with something, like if you're curious about something or photography, um, I think a big part of the creative process in my journey in photography is just getting a chance to do it as much as you can and like getting and not worrying about 
like along the journey, not worrying too much about where you're at or like being too hard on yourself. Like you, it is a process and you have to go through that and you have to learn and grow and, and you can't worry too much about perfection in the moment. And especially when you're learning. So I think to just try to get practice and, and um, I think for that too, it's awesome to be, to kind of have a creative community to have along in in your journey and that's like definitely been a big part of that for me I didn't yeah I don't know if I really touched on that too much but like at every internship I was at and in grad school the the creative community was just so important and you know lots of late night conversations about photography and creativity and visuals throughout grad school and all my internships and late nights in the office after football games after covering football games and like just just so much time with my creative community so I think those conversations help me grow um you know along with actually getting to practice it yeah I think those late nights are particularly meaningful my peers were reflecting on like our grad school experience has been very different because of the pandemic like we don't spend any time in front of Mm. each other and I think um hopefully as the world continues to reach its next Hmm. I don't like the word norm anymore. I feel like we've used it so much in the last several years, but as we reach our next kind of level of being able to talk to each other again, then yeah. those late nights are going to still be important for everybody totally. to share and make, make bonds. Um, finally, you know, what do you, um, Marlena, want people to leave knowing about you and your work and what are you really looking forward to right now? Hmm. Yeah, I think I think right now, um, well, maybe I'll go with the, what are you looking forward to <laughs> first <laughs> and then the other <laughs> question uh, will come. But I think I'm looking forward to being in a new kind of transition phase of, in my relationship to photography where I'm not as concerned about um, kind of, where I'm not as concerned about focusing on one type of photography. I think throughout this journey, especially in those really intense years of internships in grad school, I was really focused on newspaper photography and storytelling and this kind of literal photojournalism and more literal documentary photography. And I still believe that work is really important. And now I'm also trying to kind of find more, more, find my own voice in it and also explore different ways of approaching photography, whether that's more abstract or more art-based or more um Mm non-literal and then so I think that's like something I'm looking forward to is continuing that transition and continuing to kind of weave that all together um and yeah so maybe that's something I also want people to know about my work is that like I'm I'm kind of transitioning and figuring it out (laughs) as I go and that uh and that I'm really right now enjoying kind of the process and the creative visioning process for for me and my work yeah that joy in the journey is always going to be helpful because we do continue to learn and grow and um better to lean into that probably than to resist it so totally um, I think that's an encouragement to anybody and Marlena it's been such a pleasure to speak with you today I'm so excited to get to um, share your story with this other, you know, little section of the world. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking. I feel, um, it's an awesome, it's a treat to get to share some more of my story and I feel honored that you wanted to interview me. So thanks so much. Yeah.